tonight's Conversations of Great Minds, I'm joined by Guy McPherson, a Professor Emeritus of Natural Resources, Ecology, and Evolutionary Biology at the University of Arizona. Guy is one of America's most influential experts on global warming and writes about a variety of climate change related issues for the Arctic News blog and his own website, Nature Bats Last. In the field of climate science, Guy is best known for his assertion that runaway global warming is already on a path to cause the extinction of the human race, an idea he has written about in his book, Going Dark. Guy McPherson joins us now from our New York City studio. Guy, welcome to the program. Thank you, Tom. I appreciate the opportunity to be with you today. Th thanks for being with us. Um, first of all, just very briefly, if you could give us a little background on who is Guy McPherson and why should we listen to you, your, your, your background credentials and what brought you to this, to this uh, place. Sorry, the sound is cutting out pretty badly here. I think you asked me to give a background on the situation. Yes, as it currently stands with respect yeah. to climate change. Okay. Yeah. Well, we, I, I think I have a slide that I sent you that we can bring up now that shows carbon dioxide levels and mm -hmm. how high they are relative to historical records. Um, carbon dioxide levels today are probably higher than they have been in the last 20 million years. We've had human beings on the planet for about 2 million years. So carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere alone represent a major threat to the persistence of humans. In fact, looking only at carbon dioxide, John Davies, writing for the Arctic Methane Emergency Group last September, claimed that we're already at a point that we could end most habitat for humans on Earth by 2040, he's taking into account only carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, one of a handful of greenhouse gases we continue to emit. Tim Garrett had an excellent paper in climatic change published in November 2009, but actually submitted in 2007. So we've known since 2007 that only collapse of industrial civilization prevents runaway climate change. That goes back a long time now. That's, that's seven years since we've had that information. And obviously, we haven't experienced collapse. By collapse, what Tim Garrett is talking about, what I'm talking about, is no fuel at the filling station, no food at the grocery store, no water coming out of the municipal taps. If we don't cease industrial activity, in other words, all industrial activity, we will trigger runaway greenhouse effect. Only collapse prevents runaway greenhouse. And that's just looking at carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. If we go to another slide, I sent you a slide that, that shows that Earth is within 1% of being uninhabitable, uh, about 1.5 kilometers closer to the sun, according to a paper published last year in the Astrophysical Journal. And Earth goes out of the habitable zone because we, we get too close to the sun. Mm -hmm. The Earth is this little dot again, up in the upper right hand corner. Uh, again, that assumes only one of the, of the many greenhouse gases that we're emitting. So we're so close to the sun, we're so close to the in inner edge of the habitable zone for life on Earth that even a minor change in atmospheric composition could push us out of the habitable zone. Well, we haven't made minor changes in the atmospheric chemistry of the Earth. We've made major changes in the atmospheric chemistry of the Earth. We're at 400 parts, approximately 400 parts per million carbon dioxide in the atmosphere compared to the 280 parts per million when industrial activity began in the 1700s. We're at nearly 2,000, maybe 1,800 or so parts per billion of methane in the atmosphere relative to about 700 parts per billion at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. So just considering those two of a handful of greenhouse gases, we've made major changes in atmospheric composition uh, within a relatively short period of time. And so it appears that we could push Earth out of the habitable zone by making profound changes in atmospheric chemistry. Okay. You've probably heard about the contrarian myth that the Earth's temperature has plateaued, global average temperature has plateaued within the last 15, now 16 years since March of 1998. Well, we now know that that heat, and, and I showed, uh, I sent you a slide that shows where that heat is going. If you'll take a look at that, that slide that shows there's been an acceleration of heat con in, content in the oceans since 1998. So based on land surface temperature records, it appears that 
uh, global average temperatures have plateaued, but in fact, 13 of the four, 14 warmest years on record have been since the year 2000. And most of that heat has been being dumped into the oceans, absorbed by the oceans, instead of um, on land. Well, as we know, ocean is, is two-thirds or so of the total cover of the Earth. And so that's a lot of potential heat going into the oceans. It could be that when we have an El Nino event, as, as appears relatively likely later this year, it could be that a bunch of that heat is released from the oceans. Looking at one of the 30 irreversible feedback loops we've triggered, or self-reinforcing feedback loops, that of methane in the atmosphere, if you'll take a look at that slide of the globe that shows methane concentration in the atmosphere, you can see that particularly over the northern hemisphere and especially over the Arctic, we see a tremendous amount of methane being released into the atmosphere. That was not there so 50 that, years ago. That's right. That's right. Um, it was not there 50 years ago. It wasn't even there at this sort of scale 10, 20 years ago. So within the last couple of decades, we have apparently triggered the, cat, the clathrate gun. Firing the clathrate gun is the event that James Hansen was particularly worried about in his book, Storms of My Grandchildren. And if you look at methane levels about a month ago, atmospheric methane levels from about a month ago, there's a lot of dark red up there in the northern portion of the northern hemisphere. And that dark red indicates a lot of methane in the atmosphere. Just that one self-reinforcing feedback loop, methane bubbling out of the Arctic Ocean, which is reported in the scientific literature and in, in science in March of 2010, that, that one self-reinforcing feedback loop is equivalent to 1,000 to 10,000 gigatons of carbon compared to the about 300 gigatons of carbon we burn through burning fossil fuels so far. Since 1850. We, we know, go ahead, I'm sorry. Uh, since 1850, from 1850 to now, we've burned about 300 billion uh, tons uh, of, uh, That's of right, carbon dioxide. About 300 dioxide. gigatons. And, about, and, th about 300 gigatons of carbon through burning fossil fuels. And this is considerably more than that. Yeah. Th this is nearly 40 times, up to nearly 40 times, the carbon equivalent found in the methane just in the Arctic alone. And there's methane in the permafrost, and there's methane in the Antarctic as well. So there's methane coming from all kinds of sources. Just that one source, methane coming out of the Arctic Ocean, threatens to release far more carbon equivalent than we burn by burning fossil fuels. According to the authors of a, of a paper in Nature in July 2013, a 50 gigaton burp of methane is, quote, highly possible at any time. So it could be we have a 50 gigaton burp that's equivalent to more than 1,000 gigatons of, of carbon burned by fossil fuels. That's highly possible Which is at almost any time. three times what we've burned since we started the Industrial Revolution within a matter that's of right. weeks or months. That's right. And, and as reported in the, in the journal literature in a paper in Global Policy from September 2012, a suite of amplifying feedback mechanisms such as massive methane leaks from the subsea Arctic Ocean have engaged. So it's pretty clear, even in the very conservative scientific literature, that we have triggered a, a, a number of self-reinforcing feedback loops. And, and in particular, this one, runaway methane, could trigger a runaway greenhouse event. And in fact, that's the conclusion of Sam Carana and Malcolm Light, both writing for the Arctic Methane Emergency Group. So if we go to the final slide I sent mm -hmm. you, it shows a runaway event, a polynomial or exponential curve fit to the data and extended forward, and whereby we see a global average temperature of more than 4C by 2030 and more than 10C above baseline by 2040. We haven't had human beings on a planet at 3.5C above baseline. So 4C or, or 10C above baseline, those are very large numbers. I want to read to you the conclusion Malcolm Light reached in January of this year, January 2014. He says, quote, the, global, the Gulf Stream transport rate started the methane hydrate gun firing in the Arctic in 2007 when its energy per year exceeded 10 million times the amount of energy per year necessary to dissociate subsea Arctic methane hydrates. End quote. So it's pretty clear at this point we, that we have fired the clathrate gun, 
and that that self-reinforcing feedback loop alone takes us to uninhabitability of this planet for human beings in a relatively short period of time. So you're talking about something like the Permian mass extinction or the Permian Eocene thermal maximum, uh, a, a period of time where most species on Earth and in the sea die, including us? That's, that's right. That's and what right. kind of time scale? Um, well, we're human animals and so we need habitat. This isn't the, the, humans won't go extinct because it becomes too warm and we're not able to adapt to that warm temperature because it becomes too cold and we're not able to adapt. Rather, it'll come because the plants and the, and the, and the plankton in the ocean, the plants on land and the plankton in the ocean, can't respond very quickly to the very rapid changes that are occurring. So we've already lost uh, approximately half of the plankton from the ocean in the last few decades at 0.85 0.85 C above baseline. So you can imagine when we get to 2 or 3 or 4 degrees C above baseline, above the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, that it's quite possible, and I would say probable, that we won't have a significant number of plankton in the ocean at all. And same thing for land plants. We have these huge temperature swings that are going on right now. We get up to 125, 130 degrees Fahrenheit. That's sufficient to denature proteins in land plants and kill all the land plants and they just can't adapt quickly enough. How soon? Well, according to Karana's analysis, we get there by 2030, uh, to, to four, more than 4C by 2030 and more than 10C by 2040. Uh, it certainly could happen that quickly. Um, as, as Albert Bartlett, the longtime professor emeritus from Colorado University, wrote and said many times, the greatest shortcoming of the human race is our inability to understand the exponential function. Mm -hmm. We're beyond linear with respect to climate change, and it's difficult for us to, to wrap our minds around that, uh, to project into the future something beyond linear. And, and you're suggesting that we could be, you and I, we could be, and, and particularly people younger than us, could be the ones who actually see the end of the human race. Um, it, it, let, me, let me come back to that right after this break. More of tonight's Conversations of the Great Minds with Professor Guy McPherson right after this. Welcome back to Conversations with Great Minds. I'm speaking with Guy McPherson, Professor Emeritus of Natural Resources, Ecology, and Evolutionary Biology at the University of Arizona, and author of the book, Going Dark. And uh, Professor McPherson, it, just to summarize the last uh, segment when we were talking, um, essentially you were suggesting that we could see an extinction not just of frogs and minnows, but of humans within the next 15 to 40 years. Is that a reasonable restatement? Yes, that's absolutely right. You know, we, um, we, we drive some 200 species to extinction every day, and at some point, the species we drive into the abyss becomes us. I suspect the vanishing point drives nearer every day. We need many of those species for our own survival. So what are we to do? What are we to do? Um, in my opinion, we're to act with decency. We're to act as, as we should have always acted. We should act as if our time on this planet is short. And by the way, even if I'm wrong, even if all the data are wrong, even if all the forecasts are wrong, even if all the projections are wrong going into the future, I would suggest that we can act more decently than most of us have going forward. And it might actually make for a better set of human relations. Instead of grubbing for that next dollar, Let's give away our time and give away uh, our material possessions and act as if other people actually matter. L let's live here now with, with the ones we're with and, and act like that's what's important because I suspect it is. The essence of your argument then is that there's nothing to do because we passed the tipping points um, years ago, maybe even decades ago, and you know, this. this you know, this Thelma and Louise car has already gone off the side, off, off the edge of the canyon. It just hasn't hit the bottom yet. Yes, that's right. We know now that there's a 40-year lag between emissions, greenhouse gas emissions, and temperature rise. So the temperature rise we see today is a result of burning fossil fuels and releasing methane into the atmosphere by 1974. So. We also know that we've emitted more greenhouse gases in the last 29 years than in the previous 236 years combined. 
None of that has been manifest in temperature change yet. It's baked into the cake. It's already a done deal, but we are not seeing temperature rise as a result of that. So what during previous mass extinctions, how did this play out? Well, during previous mass extinctions, uh, during the Great Dying some 251 million years ago, uh, more than 90% of the taxa, more than 90% of the species went extinct uh, over a span of thousands of years. We're in the sixth great extinction. There were five tr truly profound extinction events in planetary history before this one. The sixth great extinction is the one driven by us, and it's progressing more rapidly than any of the previous great extinctions. So we know that we could lose 90% or more of the species on the planet. We know that with respect to, to temperature rise, large-bodied mammals are going to have a really tough time adapting to, to the kinds of conditions we've seen in the past. With, with, with the only a few degrees temperature rise in a short period of time, we lose habitat for mammals. Instead, what we're going to have habitat for is, is herpetofauna, lizards and snakes, uh, those sorts of species. So we go back to, well, after the, after the last great extinction, what came out of that was the age of the dinosaurs. Is that, is that what's going That's to replace right. us? That's right. So is there, can you envision anything that we could do right now no matter how extreme or radical, anything that we could do right now that could stop this and give the human, the human race another chance to get it right? Some people, some people have proposed geoengineering, in particular putting um, various particulates into the atmosphere to reflect the solar radiation back out into space. But we now have a, a half a dozen referee journal articles all of which indicate that geoengineering in its various forms will either make no difference or will actually make matters worse and in some cases far worse. So given that we're so desperate now we're willing to try geoengineering and that those geoengineering strategies have been largely uh, negated for their potential to improve the situation, I think there is nothing I know about that we can do to turn the ship around. Didn't the last uh, IPCC report specifically call for more research into geoengineering? And if so, isn't that almost an admission that the statistics that you're talking about are there, but they don't want to just put it forward? I, I, you know, I, I try not to sound like a conspiracy theorist here. Yes, that's a very conservative body putting out a very conservative report, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And in their assessment, uh, which, which came out just a few days ago, in fact, um, they admitted that geoengineering appeared to be the only viable strategy to reverse uh, climate change at this point. Right. Um, so if, if you have a very conservative body indicating that, and by the way, they didn't suggest any geoengineering strategies. All the papers that have pointed out that geoengineering is probably not a very good idea have come out just since uh, November, December of last year. So there's a yeah. suite of them that have come out and, in a and, short and period. And geoengineering is things like putting titanium dioxide into jet fuel so that we whiten the cloud layer, or putting iron oxide, uh, 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 rust filings, iron filings into the oceans to increase the bloom of algae uh, to suck out that's, CO2. That's, that's exactly right. The, the most uh, commonly promoted one of those is solar radiation management, or putting some sort of particles up into the atmosphere, right. like sulfates, for example. And in fact, Clive Hamilton, in his book, published April a year ago, the book called Earth Masters, uh, he points out that when sulfates drop out of the air, when industrial activity ceases, the temperature will warm in, in a relatively short period of time, we're talking days or weeks, will warm 1.1 C above what it's at right now. We're at 0.85 C right now. Well, that takes us to 1.95 C, let's call it two. So even collapse, as called for by Tim Garrett in his paper written seven years ago, even collapse takes us to the, to the political target of 2 C. Right. And even James Hansen has recently concluded that 2 C is horribly optimistic, that one is the Rubicon we can't cross. I suspect we crossed the Rubicon that matters, and that's the one that triggered all these self-reinforcing feedback loops. Back in the 70s. That's right. I mean, the, the, 
emissions were produced in the 70s, and we've learned about the sulfur reinforcing feedback loops within the last four years or so. Right. Now, um, you know, Thomas Malthus uh, <laughs> famously suggested. Actually, he was talking about how there are cycles of, of population building up and dying off, building up and dying off. Well, people badly misunderstand Malthus, but let's go with their misunderstanding of him, that eventually we would overpopulate ourselves to death. And, uh, you know, it didn't quite work out that way. And uh, similarly, back in the 1970s, after Paul Ehrlich published his book, The Population Bomb, in 71, I think it was, and he was uh, saying that, you know, by 1990, we would have mass famines around the world, and by 2000, you'd have wars and resource wars and things like this. Um, and he had this bet with Julian Simon, who said, don't worry, everything's cool. Humans are, you know, we're homo uh, sapiens. We're the wise, you know, humans. And we will figure it out. And they bet on a basket of commodities, because Ehrlich said, you know, we're running out of this stuff, zinc and copper and all these things. They bet on a basket of commodities, and I think the bet was a decade-long bet, it might have been five years, that the price would go up, and, and Ehrlich bet it would go up, uh, 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 Julian Simon bet it would go down. Uh, Simon won the bet. We actually started recycling things, we started being more efficient. When you combine that with Moore's Law, which says that every two years the capacity of technology doubles and the price of it halves, and you look at things like Texas and Iowa right now getting 20% of their electricity from wind power, the proliferation of electric vehicles, things like this, is it not possible that we can think our way out of this that, uh, between, well, that's between carbon my tax? Wish. Go ahead. Yeah, that's certainly my wish. I don't see a carbon tax as a way. That's the civilized approach. Remember, Tim Garrett wrote seven years ago that only collapse of the set of living arrangements uh, gives us any hope at all of persisting into the future. That's because civilization is a heat engine. And Tim Garrett knew that his civilization is a heat engine. If we're going to maintain civilization, it's going to produce a bunch of heat. The downside of collapse is that it triggers the catastrophic meltdown of 400 and some nuclear power plants around the world. Think Fukushima times about 400. And so that could be severely problematic. Um, so I, I'm, I'd like to think that there's a way out. I don't think it's a good idea for humans to go extinct, much less the 200 species we're driving to extinction every day. If, if we can find a way to get out of this mess, I'm a huge fan. I just don't see it in the data and in the projections at this point. The, the uh, just, uh, I, I believe, within 100 miles of here in Washington, D.C., there's a mountain where, uh, that was built, this was hollowed out back in the 1950s during the Cold War, where they take the president and the vice president and some members of Congress and basically put them along with a couple hundred people, support people, and lots and lots of technology, sort of a biodome three, uh, so that they could survive a, a nuclear war with the Soviet Union. I mean, that's how it was originally written. Um, I've heard people talk about the, the fortress of solitude, that the, that the Pentagon and the military is working on something up in the Arctic where humans could survive a great extinction like this for dozens if not hundreds of generations. Um, do you think we should be having that kind of conversation or colonies on Mars or the moon? Uh, I think um, first we should do no harm and clearly we've done a tremendous amount of harm. Uh, we're, we're desperate for these kinds of solutions now because the situation is truly desperate. Um, so I, I would go back to first do no harm and, and let's not think we can maintain this set of living arrangements without any consequences. As it turns out, we can't have infinite growth on a finite planet with no consequences. You know, one of the statements Julian Simon made, I'm glad you brought up that bet, was that we can continue to grow the human population at the current rate for the, current rate for the next seven billion years. Well, at the time we made that statement, if we had continued growing the human population for seven billion years, the human population alone, the mass of humans, would have been larger than the entire universe. So projecting out into the future is dangerous for seven billion years, or even for the next 20 years, as some of these models have done. Uh, could they be wrong? Yes, and I certainly hope so. Um, the, the data don't indicate as much, but I certainly am wishing for a better outcome for our species and the many, many others with which we share the planet. Yeah. We have just, just 30 seconds left. Uh, advice, thoughts, hospice? Uh, my advice is to be here now, to, to focus on the now, because this is what we have. And I suspect if you live to be 100, and maybe we all will, 
then still when you look back at your life you're going to remember a few moments the moments are what we have so let's create those fantastic joy-filled joyful moments let's be here now with the ones we're with let's treat the living planet and other human beings with with decency and respect and maybe treat ourselves with a little dignity because no matter how this turns out i don't think that's bad advice professor guy mcpherson thank you thank you don to see this and other conversations with great minds go to our website at conversationswithgreatminds.com